Hello and welcome to Reading the Gospels Together for Wednesday, April the 22nd. And our introduction to the Gospel of Mark uh, continues today. Now yesterday we talked about how the Gospel of Mark is really the Gospel of Peter as collected and transcribed by his secretary and interpreter Mark. Now the most likely timeline is as follows. Yesterday we incorporated all of those authorities, but here's what it actually boils down to. That Peter, about 20 years after the resurrection, the mid-50s AD, eventually ended up in Rome, where he spread the faith as a missionary to the Jewish community there and to the Gentile community as well. Eventually, Peter acquired an administrative assistant whom he knew from the old days in Jerusalem, a young man named John Mark, whose mother's house had been the site of one of the early churches. Mark had worked with Paul until a falling out between them, and after assisting his uncle Barnabas, John Mark settled in Rome with Peter, and he became to the old fisherman like a son. He also becomes an amanuensis, which is a, a personal secretary, recording Peter's personal thoughts and recollections and stories, which were eventually organized into what we know as the Gospel of Mark, which really should be more accurately titled the Gospel of Peter as written by Mark. So it shouldn't surprise us that Peter appears on every page because it's Peter who's telling the story as he saw it and as he was there. It is the story of Jesus from Peter's point of view. But Mark himself may actually make a brief cameo appearance, a rather surprising and unusual one, but I won't let that one out of the bag until we look at chapter 14 together. Who was Mark writing this gospel for? Well, we know that Mark wrote this gospel in Rome for Gentile and specifically Roman Christians. And because he wrote to a Gentile, meaning a non-Jewish audience, he explained Jewish customs. He translated several Aramaic expressions into Greek, which the Romans would have been able to read and understand. The gospel of Mark was written in Greek, which was the common language of the day, much like English is, uh, is the most common language in our world today. Mark used several Latin terms. He recognized time according to the Roman way. And at the climax of the gospel, he recorded the faith of a Roman centurion standing by the cross in Jesus' death. So the Romans would have been very much attracted to this gospel. It was for them. Now Mark used the life and works of Jesus to present Christ as the dynamic model of Christian life and service, especially in the face of intense opposition at the time that this gospel was written, the late 50s and maybe very early 60s, the Christians at Rome were living under the reign of the mad emperor Nero, the first and probably the severest persecutor of the church. Now, many of these Christians would die for their faith. This gospel would have greatly encouraged the Roman believers because they would have seen in Mark's narrative how Jesus persevered in the face of constant, constant opposition. Chapter 13, which contains the only long speech by Jesus in Mark's gospel, warns of the desperate troubles soon to come, and boy, did they ever. Christians living through those terrors, the, the Nero persecution, the rebellion, the Roman invasion, the destruction of the temple, they would have cherished Mark as a comfort in those days. Now, there's 16 chapters in the gospel, and Mark begins very abruptly. There's no birth narrative, and he ends even more abruptly, just with the terrified women fleeing the empty tomb. It's also very short, only 16 chapters long, and it can be easily read in 20 minutes or so. The brevity of the gospel and the 16 chapters are not coincidental. They could have been recorded and copied in a, a threefold codex. Imagine taking a, a large piece of paper and folding it and then folding it down again and again. And now you've got 16 pages. And that would have been an inexpensive and easily carried and easily concealed document. Now, there were early scribes who were dissatisfied and they often added longer endings to the Gospel of Mark. And most Bibles include those longer endings, maybe in italics or with a footnote. But the earliest and best manuscripts that we have don't include those longer endings. Uh, we'll be going through this Gospel at uh, the rate of one chapter per day. And as you read, and be sure to read chapter 1 in, in preparation for tomorrow, uh, listen for Peter's voice. Remember, this is the Gospel from from channeled through Peter's point of view. Um, 
look for Peter in the story and you'll see that very little happens in Mark without Peter actually being present. Many of the personal comments come from Peter himself. Many of the stories that we read come right from Peter's own home. Now we can find Peter's personality as well. Mark is written abruptly, not a lot of fancy words and phrases, not a lot of speeches, but a lot of action. That sounds like the Peter that we know. And look too how Peter does not try to make himself look better than he is or smarter or more heroic. If anything, the most tender passages in Mark are when Peter finds himself at his worst. Peter is an honest, honest teller of the story of Jesus. Another thing I like to notice is how much time Peter spends complaining. And most of his complaints are regarding food. You'll come across lots of passages about it being so crowded there was no room to eat, or they were so busy there was no time to eat, or even what are we going to eat? Peter's a plain spoken fellow and dinner time is very, very important to him. So as we read Mark together, we'll be getting an insight not only into Jesus from one of his very closest companions, but also into the heart of Peter as well. And so maybe we'll come closer to understanding our own hearts as we respond to Jesus and this incredible message that we find in Mark's gospel. So chapter one tomorrow, uh, start reading. I know you'll be tempted to read even further ahead. God bless you.